slides. Valisi and Lenny talking about unit five, the passive voice. Is it five or six? It's five. It's five. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've talked about the, um, the present and uh, imperfect um, subjunctive, optative, and indicative um, in the passive voice. Um, the we're now going to today today we're going to talk first about the aorist and the future passive which are the only forms of the uh, passive voice that are not the same as the middle okay mm -hmm. so they're distinctive in their forms and in their formations from the rest of the passive forms the the present mm -hmm. forms that we looked at are much more consistent with the system and these are innovative forms. They're a development out of something else. Okay, so if we look at the, the in in Greek verbs in the standard presentation of the principal parts of Greek verbs, you should come a little closer, please. <laughs> the standard pre presentation of Greek verbs, the the aorist passive is the last principal part, the sixth one. That's why it says at the bottom, use principal part six, and it takes the form of the example that we've given you in the right-hand corner here, eleuthein, most of the time. That theta there is optional, okay? Um, but it's a clear sign of passiveness. In the older Greek verbs, there is no theta um, in the aorist passive. Um, there are also some verbs that have a form with the theta and one without it, an older one and a newer one that's replacing it. So it's important to think of the theta as an optional feature that's going to become obligatory. Um, the, the key weirdness is the one that, uh, that Polisi's written under the heading aorist and future passive. That is that the aorist passive has endings that are familiar to you from active verbs. Okay, So what makes them passive is not the endings, but the theta, eta. Okay? Um, and notice that the eta remains all the way through, and the theta is becoming an obligatory part, because you need something totally different to say this is passive. So, ein, es, e, amen, eta, esan, these are relatively familiar third person, I mean, personal endings, nu, sigma, nothing, men, te, and san, we've seen th things like them in various verbs that we've looked at before. Um, what's weird is the eta that's fixed before them. There's no thematic vowel, right? So just like the aorist uh, in indicative, it's not a thematic form. It's a thematic form. Um, then there's no alternation in the eta, right? doesn't switch with omega. So we'll see what happens when you want to make an aorist passive subjunctive in a moment. Then you do have it. Um, but originally, there was the theta eta, and then you added all the subjunctive endings. We'll see that in a second. So it's it's a matter of getting the hang of this as the last principal part. You're going to see a lot of forms that look like eleuthane, epidauthain, echelausthane. That one has a, a weird S that creeps in. Epausthain, okay, stuff like that. There are funny formations in particular Greek verbs, but it's the theta eta that's the most conspicuous sign of the aorist passive. And the active ending. So what is this going to mean? I was released. Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, a past tense with, that doesn't specify completion or incompletion um, and has passive force. All right, so let's look at the optative and the subjunctive of the aorist passive, just as we looked at the optative and subjunctive of the present passive. Um, the endings are uh, are Okay, are peculiar um, only in one respect, um, and that is that they have a circumflex over them. The reason they have a circumflex is that you can no longer see the eta in the endings, okay, which is the sign of the aorist passive. Um, we're, 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 we've reduced this down from, for a matter of presentation. For example, for luo, the aorist passive subjunctive would be lu tho, okay? the circumflex accent. The circumflex accent is there in all the forms over the thematic vowel, over the alternating O and A, because what's happened is that those long vowels, which mark the subjunctive, have coalesced with the eta, that's the sign of the aorist passive. Mm -hmm. 
So that contraction process, there was a since those are long vowels, there was an accent always on the eta. When the two of them collapsed into one vowel, you get a circumflex. Okay, so there's a circumflex throughout on the eta or the omega in the aorist passive subjunctive. It's a very distinctive form. It doesn't have the the endings of the aorist passive indicative, which are those of a past tense, nu sigma, nothing, men, ten, and son. All right, um, the aorist optative has what we've seen before in some other optatives, aorist optatives. That is, it has two forms, um, uh, one in which the sign of the um, optative is iota eta before the personal endings. And notice these personal endings that we're looking at. We've got <coughs> in in the singular, we've got nu sigma nothing before the iota eta, and in the plural, men, te, and san in the iota uh, in the iota eta form of the optative. In other words, those are the same endings as the aorist passive indicative. Okay, mm -hmm. what distinguishes them is that the the um, the theta eta, which is the sign of the um, aorist passive indicative, becomes a theta epsilon or a plain epsilon in the optative. Okay, so that's why the epsilon there is a is a distinctive sign of the optative. And um, it makes it clear what's going on with these verbs uh, and distinct from other forms of the verb. All right. So notice in the plural, you, you it's actually more common to have amen, a to a n. The forms without the iota eta are more common than the ones with them in the plural, but you, you will see both. Uh, the only thing that's happened there is the eta has been suppressed and the accent, therefore, shifts to a circumflex over the epsilon plus eta iota vowel, okay? All right. Um, now we're going to lastly look at the future passive, okay, to make the story complete. Although the aorist passive has active endings, the future passive does have passive endings. But it too exhibits the theta, the optional theta with an eta as the sign of passiveness, right? That's the consistent thing. And then you have the future marker, which is a sigma followed by an O or an E. It's, that's the thematic vowel according to the regular system. O, E, E in the singular, O, E, O in the plural. So you've got the theta, eta, or just the plain eta. The S, that's the sign of futureness. And then the thematic vowel and the endings of the um, passive voice, the primary endings of the passive voice, those that are associated with the present. You wouldn't want future to have, be associated with past endings like the aorist does. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to show you the contraction that you get in the second person singular, because what happens is not the first s, but the second s disappears. So you get sigma, eta, iota subscript out of all of that. You get se, sesi becomes se i, and the epsilon, the alpha iota, contract into an eta iota subscript. So you're going to see. Uh, lu, fe, se, with an, uh, if you write it all out. And if you think about that, what does that look like? Nothing else. Okay? It's the, the theta and the eta are distinctive. If, you, if, it, if it's a verb, like there are several that don't have the theta, lu, e, se doesn't look like anything else either. All right? So these are distinctive forms, and they're systematic in their own way. Um, I don't think you have to learn a bunch of new endings. You've got to understand the formation rules and be able to, uh, to generate and recognize them. All right.